Reserve, a contributor to Atlantic Live. Welcome to our latest installment of Power of Purpose, a summit. Over the next few hours, we're going to explore how American business has found its conscience on a number of issues, from racial equity to sustainability to COVID vaccines. In many cases, bold actions from the C-suite have been spurred by consumers who, when they open their wallets, want to make sure they're giving their money to companies who act responsibly and ethically. In other cases, the change has been driven by employees who want to change their workplace culture. We want you to be involved in our conversation today. On the right side of your screen, you will see a chat function. You can submit questions there. You also can engage with one another. We want to start with a special session brought to you by our sponsor, KPMG. We want to thank them for underwriting The Atlantic's journalism. Now for a conversation on stakeholder trust, hanging in the balance, hinging on action, please welcome Gwen Houston of GM Houston Consulting, LLC, and Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Consultant and Coach. Ron Williams, Chairman and CEO of RW2 Enterprises, and Claudia Allen, Senior Advisor with KPMG's Board Leadership Center. Well, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, I think we all know that 2020 uh, amplified the harsh realities of uh, racial inequity and racial injustice in America. And we saw many corporations step forward rather quickly to support their black employees and to make statements of their commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, at the same time, we've seen many corporations criticized for the gap between their stated commitments and what is happening in reality, and some have been sued for that disconnect. Uh, as a country, I believe we're seeing a move toward uh, more of a reckoning on racial issues, but at the same time, again, we see some states enacting legislation concerning voting rights that critics argue is racially motivated. And we've seen some states adopt legislation that would affect the ability of teachers to talk about systemic racism and bias in the classroom. So there's a lot of work that remains to be done and corporations can play a major role there. So in terms of corporations getting their houses in order, I'm delighted to be joined today by Gwen and Ron, who Jean has introduced. And just additionally, by way of background, uh, in addition to their current roles, Gwen was formerly Chief Diversity Officer at Microsoft, Aetna, and um, Campbell Soup. And Ron uh, also currently sits as a director on the boards of Johnson & Johnson, American Express, and Boeing, and was the former CEO of Aetna. So Gwen and Ron, thank you so much for joining me today for this important conversation. Um, in terms of understanding systemic racism, it can be so difficult for people who have not experienced it themselves. And so storytelling, personal anecdotes can be tremendously powerful. So Gwen, let me turn to you. When you meet with business leaders, what is the story you tell? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. I try to share stories that would not necessarily be in their frame of reference. For instance, as black professionals confront racial stereotypes in the workplace, they're often working to correct what I would call false narratives associated with bias and personal preferences on top of doing their regular jobs. And I know from personal experience that when black professionals show up uh, well-prepared, uh, knowledgeable, poised, uh, confident, and highly engaged in the workplace, a couple of things can happen to them that don't necessarily happen to their white colleagues and their white colleagues might not necessarily even see it. But either they become a perceived threat or they are considered an exception by those who've had little exposure to their caliber of black professionalism and presence. Moreover, the microaggressions, which are really subtle forms of, in this case, racial bias, that they often encounter can run the gamut uh, from being told that they are quote unquote articulate uh, to being labeled intimidating or aggressive, sometimes even arrogant. I've had many a conversation with colleagues, particularly my white colleagues over the years, as the only person of color, uh, much less the only black person at the HR leadership table, about referring to me or to other blacks as articulate. Uh, 
while I know it's it's per perhaps meant to be a compliment, <laughs> it feels more like a backhanded one, because what isn't said in that word is that I defied their stereotype. You know, despite my extended educational background and loads of executive experience, sometimes beyond their own, they still didn't expect me to present well. And I would say, well, you know, Davey over here presented well, did a great job, and so did Sherry. Are, are they articulate too? And then you get that look, that frozen stare where they're not sure what to say. And I think that's the, the, the issue of I've defied their stereotype. And uh, you know, what you believe about people shows up in their behaviors. So I think when this happens to black professionals, uh, the impact is that they may start to experience, in some cases where they've been labeled uh, co you know, overly confident, intimidating, whatever, they may start to experience their careers being sidelined, um, even feeling isolated or having their visibility blocked due to others' fear of being overshadowed by them. Uh, the implications can be financially costly to blacks, who certainly understand that, that they still pose a risk in the workplace when it comes to hiring, promotion, advancing them, especially to the executive, at the executive levels. And they wonder about the fairness of their performance rating, the corresponding bonuses, the opportunities for advancement, and whether they'll be fairly compensated for their contributions over the long term. So that's the stories, those are the stories I tell. Thanks so much, Gwen. Ron, what about you? What is the story you like to tell? Well, first, let me say thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I, I think we first have to recognize that the, that the workplace is a reflection of the broader society that we live in. And while I, I personally believe that the vast majority, most people are not racist, they don't understand the implications of their behavior on others who have different backgrounds, and who come from a different set of experiences. A couple of things I like to, to remind people is how different my background and experience may be from theirs. When we meet and talk about business issues, there's, there is a real commonality. But I, I like to think about uh, uh, my grandmother. And I ask them to think about their grandmother and the relationship they had with them in the good times. And then I'd like to, to remind them that when my mother thinks about her grandmother, her grandmother was a slave. She was a person owned by someone else. And that colors the experiences that we've had all the way up until the current workplace. I then like to talk about the experiences that I get when I talk to young executives in these companies, uh, people who are early in career, mid-career, who constantly apply for opportunities in the company and never get an answer as to why they're not well qualified for the position. And they don't really understand what skills and competencies they need in order to be viewed as well qualified. One of the things that happens when you, when you look into it as a director or as a senior executive, what you learn is that often there really was never an opening for that job, yep. that that position was filled through long-term relationships that people have in the company. 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of women. There weren't people of color. They don't have those relationships. And the position was filled based on the relationship as opposed to the real competencies necessary to be able to do the job. The reality is they applied for a job that didn't exist. So what happens is people leave and they go somewhere else. And when the companies dig into the data, what they see, see is if they're effective at attracting people of color, they tend to not be effective at retaining them. And the data tends to bear this out. You know, Ron, I've, I've heard you tell a very powerful story about, uh, you know, having become the CEO of Aetna and, and heading to Washington to see the president. Would you care to share that story? Because I think it's very powerful. Sure. Um, and I think this is an example of where the outside world impinges on, on what we think of as corporate America. Um, I had become uh, uh, president and in, in, in CEO of Aetna. Um, I was very active in helping the White House on health issues. And it was, for me, a great day. I had been newly appointed to, to the role. I was going to meet the president of the United States. And I had a series of other client meetings, so we were using a uh, corporate aircraft to travel. Uh, 
I go to the flight center where you enter and you wait for the plane to get ready. And as I was entering the building, there was a young man, happened to be a white young man, who was at, at the front door, and he approached me and said, where are you going? I said, well, inside, I'm going to go to the restroom and then go get on the bus and go out to the plane. Now, I, I just said, I'm going to go inside and use the restroom. So he looks at me and he says, well, the driver's restroom is around the side. And I looked at him and I said, what is it that makes you think I am a driver? When the guy next to me came in with a backpack, blue jeans, his baseball hat on backwards, and sails right through. So why do you think I'm a driver? Mm. And the kind of concierge there rushed over, said, oh, Mr. Williams, I'm so sorry. He's new. He didn't know, et cetera. And the only conclusion you're, you're left with is I'm in a suit and tie. The guy next to me is in jeans and a backpack. What is it that causes him to think I'm a driver? And it's clearly the color of my skin. Very powerful. It did take an edge off that day, I might add, but I recovered. <laughs> Good, good. So let's turn to some of the hurdles and disadvantages that Black employees face. You've, you've talked about some of them already. And there's a very interesting April 2021 study out from McKinsey. It's called The Black Experience at Work. Um, and it highlights some of these issues, uh, the first being low representation in the executive levels. And we know that only 1% of CEOs of the Fortune 500 are Black. That number is actually down from where it had been in the past. Uh, the study also talks about a lack of trust on the part of employees toward their companies, a feeling that there's a lack of sponsorship and allyship from managers, and as you adverted to, lower odds of advancement, higher attrition. And as a practical matter, this means that corporations are losing valuable employees. So, Ron, as, as a business person, as a director, you know, how do you counsel business people about how they should be viewing uh, issues of racial equity, not just as a moral imperative, which it is, but also as a business issue? I would start with the fact that every company should be reflective of the customers that it serves. And through the reflection of that at all levels in the organization, the customer will have privileged insights into how to better serve those customers. So that's issue one. Issue two, I think, is the fact that boards collectively have not done the job that needs to be done. They hold CEOs accountable in growth and earnings, uh, broadly speaking, employee engagement, innovation, new product development. They don't hold them to the same standard when it comes to achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. That CEOs present endlessly how hard it is, how difficult it is, but they don't really do the hard work to achieve the kind of results that need to be achieved. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for boards to really insist that management do the work that needs to be done to improve the effectiveness of the organization in meeting the needs of its customers. From top to bottom, the company should really be broadly reflective of the customers that it serves. It starts with the board, it goes to the C-suite, it goes to the people who will be the, the, the future C-suite executives, and it starts to how you select and develop high potential talent who go through that corporate apprenticeship process. When you have that meeting of the senior executive, who's in the back of the room listening and learning and getting that sense of what it takes to be a senior executive. Often it's not the underrepresented individuals who are performing just as well as others. So, I mean, in terms of holding, you know, executives accountable, what, what are your thoughts on whether executive compensation should include DEI metrics um, and, and how does the board go about setting those type of metrics? Well, I would say that companies have really two principal forms of capital. They have financial capital and they have human capital. And I think broadly speaking, boards need to hold the CEO and, and the senior executive team and, and the organization accountable for the effective management and engagement of human capital. That means very specific metrics linked to incentives for their performance on these categories of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
It is a skill set just as much as understanding the financials of the company, understanding the balance sheet. That diversity should really be viewed as an executive competency. And when executives look back at their career, they should be in a position to look back at a career of accomplishment in achieving a level of diversity in their organizations. Ryan, how do you respond to people who make the argument that, you know, the talent is simply not there? Well, I would say that the talent is there. I meet many, many people who are well qualified to be CEOs of some of the leading companies in America. And what happens is simply that often the criteria that's used is not a good criteria. I use a simple example when I talk to groups. There was a point at which in order to be a policeman in the U.S. in many locations, you had to be a certain height, six feet, for example. So if you were six feet tall, you had a pretty good shot at getting that opportunity. But the minute it was determined that that was totally irrelevant to being doing a good job, people who are 5'6", 5'7", 5'8", Hispanic, Asian, women, who really brought the real core competencies necessary became eligible for that position. It isn't the lack of talent. It's the lack of the definition of what it takes to be successful, often which is unrelated to the true attributes. Another example I use, there was a period in which to be a salesman, you know, you had to play golf, you had to tell jokes, you had to go drinking with the customers. But that's really unrelated to being an effective salesperson. And by that definition, most women were ruled out. And you had to go to the country club. So most people of color were ruled out. And so there was a set of criteria by which the ability to be effective, either as a salesman, a policeman, or a CEO, were judged, which really were irrelevant to what it really takes to be effective. Thanks so much, Ron. Gwen, you work and have worked with iconic national and international companies. I mean, what is your take on what is causing these gaps and barriers to advancement? In other words, you know, what are the headwinds? Hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, when it comes to strengthening DEI progress, especially as it relates to Black and Latinx professionals, um, it's essential to start with a, a, a clear, strong foundation, beginning with, I would say, assessing the culture, assessing the organizational culture for issues of equity, uh, particularly for these di demographics, Black and, and Latino employees. Um, equity and inclusion might certainly be lacking in uh, basic areas such as compensation. Uh, Ron spoke to development, um, but also things like sponsorship. And when it comes to the retention of, of uh, a Black and Latino leaders, I think companies that, that are truly committed to closing the gap should focus on growing, developing, and advancing uh, these talented people over, or professionals over the long term. Uh, you know, not just in the immediate, let's go hire X number today or make these promotions this month. But the goal should be to create a pipeline of substantial talent uh, all the way to the C-suite, all the way over time. So you have that, that pipeline of talented folks to draw upon every, every time opportunities uh, become open. Uh, so I think that's part of the gap. And I think many companies approach DEI with all this passion and energy, but they fail to ask the hard questions required to, to sort of drive that progress sustainably over time. You know, one of the issues, I think, is looking at uh, actual numbers. And I think it can be very misleading to just look at the top line number. What, what are your thoughts on what kind of disaggregated data people need to look at to really get their arms around whether people have an opportunity not only to enter the organization, but to move through the middle and potentially further up? Yeah, going deep in the data is necessary. I mean, the data is, is very helpful in understanding what your baselines are as a company relative to diverse demographics that you can, you can track and, and assess over time. Um, but you can, it's also important to look at the intersectionality of cohorts when you uh, assess data. So you can look at gender and race and nationality in a compounded way to sort of get an understanding of 
who's making um, progress in the organization, who are we hiring, who are we advancing? And I think along with that, uh, you have to ask, what are the right metrics for us to be assessing? Sometimes companies can, can wallow so deeply in the data uh, that it's analysis paralysis. We have to ask ourselves, you know, are the outcomes that we've defined uh, as metrics of success in our organization, are these the right metrics to hold us accountable for making progress relative to, you know, to black, Latino professionals, women, uh, and other, other uh, underrepresented groups. Um, they also, you know, I think, need to look at issues of job specifications. So beyond just the reporting of the data, let's think about what's happening in our organizations. Uh, which job specifications could perhaps be broadened um, uh, or flexed to broaden the pool of, of available and qualified candidates? For example, is industry experience really a necessity, or is it? You know, can there be uh, other things that we look at? Uh, certain tenure experiences, or is that a requirement for candidates, or can they bring other strengths that uh, that might be relevant in other areas? Um, additionally, some things that companies should be thinking about doing, uh, and I've had this experience in, in my last company, is to have these to be intentional about what we're doing. So many companies don't want to declare where they have opportunities for the greatest improvement relative to diversity demographics. And it may be that they have to declare, this is a time we're going to focus on progress relative to our Black and Latinx populations. I know there's fear to, to make those declarations, but when you're intentional, things can change. And I think it's to say, look, these are our, our demographics, these are parts of our population that where we have the greatest opportunity for progress to be made. Doesn't mean we're not going to focus on all groups, but these are areas where, you know, we have an opportunity to, to do better. And I think just calling it out, being intentional is, is extremely helpful. Uh, but talented, uh, talent, targeted talented talks, talent talks are a necessity to really get to understand who are the people in our organizations who fit this yeah. demographic and what do we know about them? And how do we focus on their success and retention? Because if they leave and the hemorrhaging starts to happen out the back door, it's a very difficult thing, especially at the senior levels, for companies to recover from. Uh, the network of black executives and Latino, Latinx uh, professionals is, the, is very powerful. And the word on the street that people leave companies because of leaders and culture uh, is very powerful. So these are things companies need to to think about and tackle uh, more proactively. So Gwen, I mean, it's often an issue, you know, people talk about competencies for a job, and, but sometimes the reality is that competencies are mixed with questions of style. Can you, can you address that? Yeah, I like to talk about this because it's so true. It, it speaks to the issue of requirements of the job versus preferences for the job. And a lot of times uh, when leaders are trying to fill backfill positions, especially senior level, very important jobs in the organization, they tend to think about who was successful in that role previously. And the person who was successful in the role previously uh, may not always be reflective of a, a, a woman of color or a person of color. And so I have had to work very aggressively with our talent acquisition organizations to not let uh, hiring managers filter out uh, qualities and candidates because of personal preferences, where they'll say, well, you know, did they go to these schools? And did they have these internships? And did they spend time in these particular roles on the way to a senior leadership opportunity? And the truth is, for many women and, and, and uh, people of color, we, we wouldn't have had access to those same opportunities as readily as, as, as white males might. And so it makes it difficult for us to meet all those boxes that are checked when, in fact, all those boxes that are checked are not necessary requirements, are not legitimate requirements for performing the no. job. And they certainly aren't indicators of success either. Thank you for that. Let's turn to uh, some audience questions for our last five minutes. Uh, one question we have is, what should U.S. headquartered global companies be doing to make their DEI policies relevant outside the U.S.? Would one of you like to take that? I'll start. And I, I, I think, first of all, you, you really, it's, it's a little tricky to try to 
to expand uh, DEI policies in all parts of the globe. If you, if you happen to be a, a very large global company with a, uh, a substantial footprint around the world, in some cases, uh, the issues that define DEI in the U.S. Uh, are not necessarily relevant around the world and in certain countries. Uh, it's also illegal to gather certain data in parts of the world around race and, and nationality. So you have to be very careful about exporting uh, a universal definition of, of DEI uh, initiatives around the world. I think the goal is to look for what is core and common uh, around the world. Certainly gender is, is, is a natural, uh, in some cases disability, uh, even LGBTQ initiatives are star QA uh, are starting to be more globally relevant. But I think you have to start with the common denominator and work your way in, in that regard. What I've also found is the issue of inclusion tends to be more broadly understood and, ex and, and activate, you know, the type of thing that you can activate on a global level uh, for companies. Uh, so I think everybody really wants to understand uh, how to be more inclusive in their organizations and how to think about uh, issues of difference uh, as it relates to bringing on greater talent, uh, serving more customers, uh, and, and really being a productive and, and successful business. So, uh, and then the social justice issues are also uh, the types of things you have to weigh carefully depending on the part of the world. It can be done though, and it can be done very effectively. Thanks, Gwen. Ron, let me address the next question to you. How do you help ensure that a company's DEI efforts are sustained long-term versus just being the issue of the day? Well, I think it really starts with making certain that you have a board that is, broadly speaking, uh, diverse, gender, ethnicity. Then that board has to really task management with looking at all of the processes and policies up and down the organization to be certain that they are consistent with the strategy the company has laid out in this area. Companies have many policies and procedures that have evolved over time, particularly large legacy companies. Um, how are positions filled? What's the tuition reimbursement program look like, for example? If you look at most tuition reimbursement programs, you have to pay the tuition to get reimbursed. That works really well if you're a highly compensated professional. If you are working at the call center level, you don't have the spare resources. And if you look at most of the organizations, a, a lot of the more underrepresented minorities are in fact in the lower compensated positions. You, you have to look at the talent management processes, for example, from top to bottom. Careers are made or lost in middle management. And the organization has to really make certain that the middle of the organization really understands that this is about increasing the basis for competition, adjusting it to the real skills and competencies necessary to be effective as Gwen outlined. So the board's role, and I think senior management role, is to be certain that talent management, recruitment, retention, inclusion are really effective and that they understand where they are through regular ongoing updates and reports and establishing goals and objectives that are measured and holding management accountable. I think that's how you make really important progress. You don't get there by a once a year annual report to the board. You get there through the regular business planning process. And I think one of the most important things for boards to communicate is, this is really about increasing the competitive set. When you were that police officer who was six feet tall, who didn't get the job anymore, who applied to be a policeman and didn't get the job, your reaction is, well, I'm not the right demographic. Well, no, you are one of the right demographics, but you now have a broader competitive set of well-qualified candidates, and we're gonna pick the best candidate. That may be a woman, it may be a minority, it may be you. And so I think that getting that through the middle is critically important to make it a sustainable event in organizations. And that's looking at the policies, the processes, the practices, and most importantly, the results. Well, thank you so much, uh, Gwen and Ron. We're at the end of our time. I wanna thank you for, on behalf of KPMG and the Board Leadership Center for a fascinating and very important discussion. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you to KPMG and to our panelists. Stay tuned. We'll be back shortly with more Power of Purpose. to have visionaries you know you have to have people that will think outside of the norm we have to be given the power to tell our own stories we all want to say our piece this is a crazy time what they care about is what it means to them you have to not think like society thinks this is a fight about power who has it and who has the right to use it we're having a reckoning about what public safety can should and must look like it's about a broader question of representation who gets to create the images and define how we see the world they want their voice to be heard they have to get involved finally we get to tell our truth and tell our stories like our stories matter What's going to bring people together is equality. The love that we have for each other is the shortcut to true human happiness. You start to see how it's all connected. Every single person around the world can create a movement. 